Hello, everybody. Welcome to our live video today. I always just want to say Sundays at Summit Health, but we're changing it up a little bit. So um, thank you for joining. If you are on, um, I will try and answer any questions you have in real time. Otherwise, what we're going to do today is just go step by step macro basics. So if you are somebody who's like, I don't know what a macro is. Um, I've never heard of that. I've never tracked my food before. I have no idea what makes a carbohydrate. We will go through all of that today. So um, thank you very much for tuning in. And if you are somebody who is a pro and has been doing this for years, this just might be a nice little refresher to remind you why we eat the way we do. And um, it's just kind of a back to basics course. So thanks for tuning in. Let's go ahead and dive in. Um, if you've been a part of this group for a while, you've probably um, have a decent handle on what macros are and how to track them. So today is a deep dive into each macro, um, what it is, how it affects our health and performance, and then we'll wrap up with some tips on how to track your macros effectively. It's important to note that logging your food is not the only way to lose weight or even to eat balanced macros. So we'll cover those methods in other videos, but today we're going to really focus on if you are logging your food, um, how to hit your macros. So first we're going to start with everybody's favorite macronutrient, which is carbs. Um, carbohydrates are you know, all, all three macros are made up of certain molecules. And so carbohydrates are molecules that are classified according to their structure. So you probably remember this from your health class. There are two types of carbs. There's simple and complex carbs. Simple carbs are smaller in their molecules. Um, they're easier, easier to digest, or I should say, um, they're easily processed and they're known as mono and disaccharides. I'm sorry, back up. Simple carbs are small and easily processed molecules known as mono and disaccharides. Well, more complex carbohydrates are known as polysaccharides. So mono meaning one and two, one and disaccharide meaning two, and then polysaccharides have multiple. You don't need to remember all of that, but the difference being that um, one group has a lot more sugar linked together than the other. Um, each subtype of carbohydrates has a different effect on your body. So depending on the structure of the carb and its food source, it's going to digest differently. These effects that it has on our body include how quickly and easily the molecule is digested and how much of it is actually absorbed and used by our body. Um, which other nutrients are provided along with the carbohydrate source also matters. And so um, it's good to know what is a simple carb, what is a complex carb, and what is the right balance for me. Um, eating carbs can alter your energy levels and can even affect things like disease progression in the body. All carbohydrates we consume are digested into monosaccharides. So that's the one, and that is the simple carb. Um, so they're all digested into simple sugars before they are absorbed by the body, regardless of whether the food source is a cube of sugar or a really high fiber, healthy bowl of protein. They're both carbs. It's just that the healthier carb or the complex carb is digested and absorbed much slower, while the non-healthy carbs, like the sugar cube, are digested very quickly. Most people are aware that anything that has a lot of sugar, like a cookie, um, most people are aware that those are not healthy carbs. What a lot of people don't realize is that your healthy carbs are made up of things like fruits and vegetables. When you think of high carb foods, most of us aren't thinking of fruits and veggies, but they're also primarily carbohydrates. So when you're working with your coach and you have a prescribed number of carbs, it's important not only to hit that number of carbs, 
but to be mindful of the source of those carbs. It's no big deal to enjoy a cookie every once in a while, but we do want, we don't want that being your main carb source. We want a lot of those to come from more whole foods. So why do we need carbs? Carbs are our body's primary energy source um, for all of our body's cells. Carbs also cause a release of insulin and a larger insulin response can be beneficial at certain times, like right after an intense workout. It can be nice to have that insulin response. And then there's other times where it's not very beneficial, like at bedtime. We don't want that rush of energy. So it's essential to note that although the fundamental process of digestion is the same, people differ in their tolerance and handling of carbohydrates. Um, the type of carbs also plays an important role, like we had mentioned. If your diet consists of simple sugars, refined carbohydrates, which the body breaks down really fast, so these are your sugary foods, you may notice elevations in things like blood trig triglyceride levels, bad cholesterol, and insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is also very closely linked with diabetes. So when it comes to insulin resistance because of an over intake of carbs, it's usually these simple carbs that are the problem, not the complex carbs. So on the other hand, carbohydrates that are digested and absorbed slowly, such as whole grains, fruits, vegetables, they actually help control your insulin response, give you more steady energy levels and help with body composition, which is nice. These are things like unrefined, unprocessed, complex carbohydrate sources that help to reduce then the triglycerides and improve your cholesterol profile. Um, since the wave of low carb diets started, um, I think Atkins was to blame for that, a lot of people are afraid to eat carbs. And ironically, a lot of the people who are afraid to eat carbs are consuming more of them than they even realize they are. So just to give you some numbers, for the general population, a minimum of about 130 carbs daily is recommended. Now, obviously, there are a lot of factors that change that number significantly. The main factors being body size and activity level. So a bigger or more active person will need more carbs, while smaller or sedentary people require less carbs. Your intake is also dependent on how much fat and protein that you're eating outside of your carbs. So we'll get back into that in a little bit. The last thing to mention when we're talking about carbs is fiber. The minimal recommended daily intake for fiber is 25 grams a day. It's optimal to get more. Um, we would like to see women getting about 35 and men getting over 45 a day. Um, fiber comes in different forms and we don't need to go too far into that, but it is really important to be consuming fiber to help you feel full. It helps control your blood fat levels. Um, it can help with preventing colon cancer, it can help with motility, gut health. There's just so many benefits. Um, however, when it comes to fiber, something that is really frustrating and that we need to be hyper aware of when, our log when we're logging our food is the phenomenon known as net carbs. So companies will use the phrase net carbs to undersell the amount of carbs that you are eating. Um, the biggest one that I've seen is in tortillas. So I'll use that as my example. But for every gram of fiber that is added to a food or that a food contains, legally they can say that that's one less carb as if one gram of fiber and one carbohydrate cancel each other out and while there is some truth to that um that is not how we at summit health go about tracking our macros so if you pick up a bag of tortillas the low carb tortillas at your grocery store and the bag says four net carbs you're like great these tortillas only have four carbs perfect. And then you flip it over and read the actual nutrition label. And then the tortilla has 19 carbs, but 
15 grams of fiber. And so they're able to put four net carbs on there because the 15 grams of fiber cancel out 15 of the carbs. When working with Summit Health, again, we would want to count all 19 of those carbs. We're going to encourage you to get your fiber intake anyway, and we are prescribing numbers assuming that you are still going to eat those 25 grams of fiber. We still want to know how many carbs you're eating. Um, so be sure, read the nutrition label, and of course, getting that fiber is a good thing, but we want to count all of those carbs. Next, we are going to be discussing the different types of fat what constitutes a healthy fat, and the importance of balancing our fat intake. I won't bore you with a bunch of science, but like carbs, fats are molecules that have different types of structures, which means we digest each type differently. The molecular configuration also determines whether the fat is healthy for us or not healthy for us. Um, there are three main types of dietary fats, and these will not be new words for you. Saturated, monosaturated, polysaturated. In popular terms, and again, what you probably learned in health class is that monosaturated and polyunsaturated fats are what most people refer to as the healthy fats. Yet, humans have likely consumed unprocessed forms of saturated fats um, that are in like organ meats from wild game, blubber from seals and whales, milk, um, coconuts. For our whole existence, we have been consuming saturated fats that are just not processed. So a better definition of a healthy fat is going to be relatively unprocessed fats from whole foods. Instead of worrying too much about um, polyunsaturated fats, oversaturated fats, it, it's fine. It, don't worry about that as much as you are worrying about is this fat source from an unprocessed whole food? The less processed it is, the healthier it's going to be in most cases. Unhealthy fats are typically those that are industrially processed and designed to be non-perishable. These are trans fatty acids that appear in processed foods, um, hydrogenated fats such as margarine, or shelf-stable cooking oils, those types of things are going to be really bad for us. Anything that says trans fat, run for the hills. Try and stay away from that. Balancing our fat intake, though, is super essential. This is another one people are kind of afraid of. Um, but we want to balance the different types of fat that we are getting. When we lived in caves, we were likely consuming a diet of whole foods with a fat intake from the mono, poly, and saturated sources distributed evenly. So we were getting every kind of fat distributed evenly. Um, scientists estimate that the omega-6, unhealthy fat, to omega-3, healthy fat, ratio in a hunter-gatherer diet is about one to one. So every unhealthy fat we're eating, we're also eating a healthy fat. And that's a, actually a really good ratio. Um, humans today consume anywhere from about 16 to 1 to 20 to 1. So what we're saying is you don't have to avoid those unhealthy fats at all costs, but for every unhealthy fat, we want you to also have a healthy fat. Um, healthy fats are important because they exert powerful effects within the body. So. We need adequate fat to be able to support our metabolism, to support cell signaling. Um, the various healthy body tissue um, needs fat in order to keep your body healthy. Your immunity is affected by your fat intake. A huge one, especially for women, but also for men, is your hormone production. And lastly, your ability to absorb nutrients. So if you're not getting enough fat, your body tissue won't be healthy, your metabolism is gonna struggle, um, your body won't produce and use the right hormones, and you're not gonna get the same benefits from your other food as you would if you had enough fat. Healthy fats have been shown to offer a wide range of healthy benefits, including cardiovascular protection, improving your body composition, alleviating depression, preventing cancers, preserving memory and eye health, 
and reducing aggressive behavior, ADHD, and ADD symptoms. That's a lot of reasons to eat your fats. And the only reason I'm listing so many is that fat also can have a scary reputation and a lot of people may try to decrease their fat intake as much as possible. Not getting enough fat will likely lead to more health issues than most people realize. The fat we consume is then digested and used for energy or stored as adipose fat tissue or incorporated even into body tissues and organs. Many of our tissues are lipid based, including our brains and fatty sheaths that insulate the nervous system. Our cell membranes are also fat based. So like your so much of your body is made up of fat and that's why it's important for us to eat enough because if those sheaths aren't fatty enough, they're not going to, it's almost like a lubrication for the connections in your brain. So you'll notice if you're, if you're under eating fat, you might have some brain fog um, and your cells aren't going to feel as good as they would if you were eating adequate fat. Um, if we're not eating enough, we'll have low energy. Um, our organs won't be able to do their job as well. And if we're overdoing it on fats, our body will store them and that's when we start gaining weight. So it comes to this balance with fat where we want to eat enough that our body is able to function, our brain functions well, we can use it as an energy source, but we don't want to eat so much that our body doesn't need it for our organs or for energy and it just stores it. So that's any kind of excess fat that you have, that's where that's coming from. In conclusion, it's important to emphasize whole food fat sources in our diets. Um, and supplementing if necessary. So something like a fish oil to supplement your omega-3s um, helps functioning with the entire body. Lastly, we're gonna talk about protein. Um, protein molecule are molecules just like fat and carbs, but protein molecules are made up of amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. Um, you may have heard the term EAAs or BCAAs, um, the AA part of that is amino acid. So there's two categories of amino acids, essential and non-essential. Essential amino acids or EAAs are those that the body can't manufacture on its own. So we have to eat them. We have to get them through our diet. Non-essential amino acids are ones that your body can usually make for itself. Um, proteins play a crucial role by producing enzymes and hormones, neurotransmitters, and antibodies. So enzymes are things that help your body to have the chemical reactions that make it function. Obviously, we know what hormones are. Neurotransmitters are chemicals in your brain that help your body to communicate with your brain. And then antibodies are fighting off diseases. It also helps replace worn out cells and transport various substances throughout the body and then aids in growth and repair of not only our muscles, our, actually our entire body. When we consume protein, the body then breaks it down into individual amino acids. So they're in a little chain and then when we start to digest them, they break down into individual amino acids. And then they go into sort of a pool or like just a store and then our body draws from that store when we need amino acids. So the hope is that we are always restocking that pool so that when our body needs to use those amino acids to get rid of some of the old cells, worn out cells, we have enough in the tank. This is when we don't have enough in the tank, that's when we start to see um, a really hard time recovering. Protein can also help control body fat by releasing a hormone that helps your body to store glycogen and glucose, which we get from carbs, and it helps to loosen up that stored fat that we're all walking around with and actually puts it to use. So this is why even when we decrease your calorie intake to get you into a cut and get you to start losing weight, we keep protein fairly high. We're taking most of the calories away from carbs and fat and we're gonna keep your protein high so that your body is in a better position to use its stores 
to help you feel good and energized even during your cut. It's very hard for your body to access that stored energy if you don't have enough protein. So how much protein is enough? How much do we actually need? Um, how much you need specifically will depend on your weight and your activity level. The basic recommendation for protein intake is about 0.8 grams per kilogram, not pound, kilogram of body mass for general healthy adults. If you want to know what that is for you, go on Google, type your weight in in pounds, switch it to kilos, and then take that number times 0.8. And that's about the minimum of what you need. For high intensity training, if you do CrossFit or any kind of other high intensity training, the protein needs to go up to about 1.4 to 2 grams per kilo of body mass. And while these suggested protein intakes are necessary for basic, basic protein synthesis, we might need even more in our diets for optimal functioning. So those numbers I just gave you, that's like enough to keep you functioning but if you want optimal functioning good immune system metabolism you want to feel full you want your weight to go down you want to perform um you might need even more than that the other thing though is that we can only store so much protein at one time and our protein stores fluctuate over the course of the day so it's crucial really really crucial to consume moderate amounts of protein at regular intervals. This means that if it's 8 p.m. and you have 70 more grams of protein you need, pounding protein shakes or eating an entire chicken is not worth it. Um, you want, as you wind down for the evening, you're trying to hit your protein goal by eating 70 grams of protein. It's fairly useless because your body won't even be able to absorb that. So try to work it in earlier in the day, um, especially breakfast and that first snack. You have to have protein in both of those. And then when it gets to the evening time, you don't have to worry about wasting any protein. In summary, protein is essential for our bodies and it's important to consume an adequate amount of protein to function and recover well. Now that we know what the three macronutrients are, we're going to explore how to count and track macros for fat loss, muscle gain, better health, whatever your reason is. Um, we're going to talk about how to track and then um, just a few, a few tips when it comes to measuring food and things like that. Um, macros or macronutrients, same thing, are large groups of nutrients. That's why they're called macronutrients, different than micronutrients. So there are three main ones that we just talked about, protein, carbs, and fat. And tracking macros means tracking our food intake using how many grams of each macro instead of counting calories. So a lot of the apps that you download just count calories for you. Instead of counting that, we're going to count how many grams of each macronutrient we're digesting. We'll cover how to calculate and track your personal macronutrients, and why macros aren't the full story when it comes to health. I also want to mention again that um, this is not the only way to measure your food. So um, you can measure macros with your hands, you can eyeball it, um, but we're going to try and just, again, stay focused on if you're actually tracking and then we'll cover how to measure and how to track alcohol. And hopefully by the end, you'll feel more equipped to hit the ground running when it comes to tracking your macros, especially if this is your first time. So, um, once you have determined your macros, whether it's you determining them yourself, or usually it's a coach who's prescribing them to you. You'll then want to make sure you are meeting those goals every day or at least getting close. I like to recommend for people to get within five if they can um, with fat and we'll talk about why fat's a little different, but getting within two is really ideal for fat. Uh, most people like apps like Fitness Pal, Chronometer or Macros Plus. There's all kinds of them out there to track your macros. 
Um, using an app has a couple of advantages because you have a quick reference guide for how much of each nutrient, um, each macro a serving of food contains. And the app will add up your macros for you and then let you know how many you have left for the day. You can, like we said, you can measure by hand or you can write things down on paper or use a database. Um, but when you're getting started, we really, really strongly recommend using an app. Um, the nice thing about Fitness Pal is that your coach can then be friends with you on Fitness Pal and can see your logs without you having to share them all the time. Um, so once you have your app down downloaded, you can search for and record the foods you've eaten at each meal and make sure when you're doing that, that there are, that there's macro information in the nutrition facts. So if somebody added the food themselves, they might not have put that information in there. So if you, if you're logging a burger cause you're out to eat and it says 500 calories, but has zeros for protein, carbs, and fat, you'll want to try and pick a different option that actually has the macros in there. Or if you're stuck, ask your coach for some help. Um, many people find it helpful to plan their meals the night before or in the morning when you wake up. Um, and building meals that actually help you hit your macro goal instead of playing macro, macro Tetris is what we call it, where you are standing in your kitchen and you have 60, pro, 60 grams of protein left and only 10 carbs and you're already three over on your fat. So you're like, what am I going to eat? I have no idea. Um, we don't, we want to avoid that situation as much as possible. You can't always avoid it, but planning your day out earlier is very helpful because then you just need to look at your log to see what you need to eat versus logging everything you already ate and then realizing you've gone over or you haven't had enough. Um, personally, when I do this, plan the whole day from the beginning, I start with my protein because that seems to be the hardest one to hit. Everything else is pretty easy to fill in the blanks. Um, but start by making sure you have enough protein and then as you supplement in your carbs and your fat, you can decrease the amount of grilled chicken that you're putting on your salad all the time. Um, most apps will also allow you to save meals. So if you tend to repeat meals every once in a while, having a pre-entered and pre-calculated food combination can make tracking more efficient. That's something we hear a lot is that tracking is just too time consuming. So make it easier on yourself and save your meals if you eat the same a lot. This is also a good tool if you like cooking your own recipes that might not be saved in the database or they're incorrect in the database. Um, and if you're planning on eating out, logging ahead of time can be a really good strategy for sticking to your macros as well. Before you go, check the menu um, of the restaurant and do your best to determine or estimate what the macros of your meal are going to be. Um, a common question we get when it comes to this, this all sounds good and it all makes a lot of sense. And then people go in and try and hit their macros the next day. And they're like, this is impossible. What do I eat on a macro diet to get, to be able to hit my numbers? As you get used to tracking, you will start to learn what foods are high in protein, carbs, and fat. If you've never paid attention to macros before, things are going to start blowing your mind. Once you have a few months under your belt though, you'll be able to look at almost any food and be able to tell me what the highest um, calorie source is. Is it mostly protein, mostly carbs, or mostly fat? But one thing macronutrient counting doesn't take into account is micronutrients. Macro is big nutrients, micro, small nutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals that are usually found in whole minimally processed foods. So I just wanted to mention those quick because micronutrients are necessary for good health. So it's important to ensure that you're eating a diet that meets your macro and micronutrient needs. Hit your macros primarily through a variety of minimally processed foods that are naturally rich in micronutrients. These are things like lean proteins, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, 
um, legumes, nuts and seeds, and pressed oils. That's where we're going to have a lot of micronutrients. You can hit your macros eating pizza and drinking protein shakes. You'll be able to make those numbers work. You probably won't feel that good though because those things don't have micronutrients. You need to eat whole foods to be feeling really good. So when measuring your food, a food scale will always yield the best results. I would never recommend starting to track your macros if you don't have a food scale. Um, measuring by weight will always be more accurate than measuring by volume. So if you're like, well, I do measure all my food. I use my measuring cups, my measuring spoons. I don't need a food scale. Um, the example that I have heard is that depending on how the food is prepared is going to change how that measurement looks. So for an example, um, almonds. If I say, um, whether they're whole or chopped, a cup, one cup will fit about 100 grams of almonds, whole or chopped. But if these almonds are finely chopped, like slivered almonds, they're easier to pack into a cup and that might fit 200 grams. So on a scale, 100 grams will always be 100 grams. It doesn't matter how you cut the almond, it's going to be 100 grams versus using a measuring cup and the size of the almond and how it's prepared is going to affect how many you eat and you could really throw your numbers off and not even realize you're doing it. If your only option is measuring cups and spoons, that's okay. I would rather you do that than guess. So just to be sure, especially in the beginning, I want you to measure everything rather than eyeballing it. Uh, people tend to overestimate what a tablespoon or a cup looks like. Um, and sometimes you unintentionally double your portion. It seems to happen more with fats and carbs and less with protein. We're like, oh, that chicken breast is definitely, definitely a pound and a half. Probably not. Um, if you don't believe me about overestimating, go have a piece of toast with an actual true measured serving of peanut butter and you will know what I mean. Uh, last thing I want to cover, thank you for hanging in there, I know this is kind of a long one, um, is alcohol. So alcohol is a goofy one because it contains calories but no macronutrients unless something like sugar was added. So the reason that counting macros enables you to not count your calories is because macros are what make up your calories. So in one gram of fat, if your, if your nutrition label says, you know, fat, one gram, that is making up nine calories. That's where they get the calorie number from, is from the macronutrients. So um, in one gram of fat, there are nine calories. And in one gram of protein or carbs, there are four calories. Those two are the same. Um, I'm going to use this peanut butter as an example because it has all three macronutrients. Um, so let me show you how this macro math works. I don't know if you're able to see this, but this, um, this jar of peanut butter, one serving, has 190 calories. It has 16 grams of fat, 6 grams of carbohydrates, and 7 grams of protein. So if we do the math that I just took you through, we take this 6 and multiply it by 4, so 24 calories worth of carbs in here. 7 times 4, which means 28 grams or 28 calories worth of protein in here. And then 16 fat, so 16 times 9, yes I wrote it down, is 144 calories. So if we add up 144 calories from fat, 24 calories from carbs, and 7 calories, or uh, 28 calories from protein, we get 196 calories, which is pretty close to what this is. Um, most of your food will add up that way. Alcohol does not. So also if you were like me and thought that protein was a, or uh, peanut butter was a good source of protein as a kid, you're wrong. It's, it's mostly fat, which is really disappointing. Um, if we look at a Topo Chico margarita, it's like a seltzer, like a White Claw, 
Um, if we look at the label, besides the calories, it says zero fat, three carbs, zero protein. So if we added that up using the math we just did, this would be, there's no fat, there's no protein, just three carbs, so this would be 12 calories total. But it's 100. So where are these calories coming from? Um, as it turns out, alcohol is quite literally empty calories. They're just calories that provide no nutritional benefit whatsoever. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't have a drink now and then. It just means that we're going to track that a little bit differently. So if you decide to have one of these this weekend, the easy thing to do would be you just punch this in and you only count, all right, three carbs, no problem. I can have about 20 of these. Wrong. Um, if we do our macro math, it's only 12 calories and it's actually 100. So this is where calories do start to matter a little bit. We're gonna do math like we just did, but we're gonna do it in reverse. So if you wanna have one of these this weekend and you want it to fit your macros, instead of paying attention to the numbers down here, I want you to actually take the calorie number and divide it by four, which is 25, and you're gonna log that number of carbs. You can do the same thing, divide it by nine, and log it as that many grams of fat. Again, you're gonna take the calories, divide it by four and log it as carbs, or divide it by nine and log it as fat. Um, the other thing you can do is kind of mix and match or make a combination of them so that it fits your day better. The only rule here is to not take it out of your protein doesn't count to take it out of your protein because we absolutely need you eating your protein. A method that I've used for this is to make sure that you hit your protein goal and then just look at how many calories you have left for the day and base your alcohol off of that. So let's say I add up all of my cal or I logged my whole day, I hit my protein goal and I have 200 calories worth of fat and carbs left and it's kind of a weird combination of both. That means if I have 200 calories left and I already hit my protein, I can have two of these because there's 200 calories, they're each 100. Um, I hope that helps. I know the alcohol thing can be a little bit tricky in doing all the math. A shortcut, um, Fitness Pal has a lot of these already pre-logged. So if you search Coors Light as carbs in Fitness Pal, it'll pull up 105 calories, um, 26 carbs, and you'll be able to easily log it like that. I hope this helped. Um, thank you all for listening. Again, I know this was kind of a long one. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all um, next month. Thank you.